So I'm talking to Sean Kennedy. He's sent us some music to play on the show today that has to do a little bit with the 4th of July. But before we get to that, Sean, tell us where you live and what you were doing before the pandemic shut us all down. Sure thing. And uh, thanks for having me. Um, I've really been looking forward to talking with you about this. And I can't tell you, uh, as a musician, how exciting it is to actually have something on my appointment calendar uh, (laughs) during these challenging times. So I am a freelance drum set and percussion artist and band director uh, in Philadelphia, right outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And that's where I live also. And I guess maybe uh, a lot of your work came to a halt. Like many musicians, you probably found yourself with no gigs and maybe you had a lot of extra time you could focus on projects that you had never had time for. Maybe you could even revisit some of the fundamental skills that all musicians have to keep up in order to maintain their technique. So what did you do during the shutdown? Yeah, that's right. It afforded me a lot of opportunities to do things, and two of the main things are to focus on the technology of music and fundamentals, like you mentioned. Uh, There's an expression I've heard many times that says, be careful what you wish for, it might actually happen. Uh, I can't tell you how many times as a musician and as just a person, I've said to myself, if only I had unlimited time to do X, Y, and Z. Well, that happened this year. Yes. So with recording, about eight years ago, my parents bought me all of this beautiful recording equipment, uh, microphone, software, lots of things with buttons and uh, lights that light up, and I've never had a chance to use it. So about two weeks after this national shutdown happened, I finally had time, and I had nothing else to do, and I figured out how to record myself at a uh, professional level in my home uh, percussion studio. So that kind of uh, is connected to all this because I started to learn how to record myself at home without having an engineer, and I made myself the engineer. I see. Um, Well, I think a lot of us have learned a lot more about technology than maybe we even wanted to during this time. But but this is good that, that you put that time to good use doing that for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And then the second thing was the fundamentals, like you mentioned. I find myself as a mainly a freelance musician Uh, Most of my practice at home is devoted to getting ready for whatever the next gig is coming up. Right, right. And, um, yeah, and you don't have enough time, I don't anyway, to to go back and really work on uh, technical things. And um, for us drummers, uh, on snare drums specifically, there are no scales. And one thing that I think was lacking from my personal practice, um, as much as I wanted it to be there, was um, rudimental drumming. Uh And rudiments of the snare drum... Uh, are kind of like the scales for drummers. And now there are 40. There are 40 standard rudiments, and they're broken into a few families. We have roll rudiments, uh, diddle rudiments, flam rudiments, and they have all these silly names, if you're not familiar with it. (laughs) I remember Uh, the term paradiddle from junior high school, I think. Yeah. (laughs) Exactly. And they came from the uh, old military tradition, from when 12-year-old boys were the drummers on the battlefield. And I learned that it was a way for the young boys to remember them. For example, one of the first things you learn on drums is called an open roll. And technically, it's a right, right, left, left, right, right, left, left. Okay. And you get to really fast speeds and you sound like a helicopter. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but they told the 12-year-old boys to just go dada, mama, dada, mama. Oh. So some of these names are, sound a little silly because of the way they had to teach them. And um, so... Because of the shutdown, I really got to delve into some books that I haven't opened, uh, maybe even since high school, some of those uh, basic rudimental books. And, and as a drummer, most times when you take formal lessons, part of your training is in this old school military uh, vocabulary. And that ties into the piece we're going to be talking about today. Well, tell me a little about this piece. It's called The Fall sure. of Paris. And if you just go looking for it on the Internet, you'll find some performances, but not much information about it. Exactly. And if you would allow me, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the history of the tune and how I came to arrange it for a brass ensemble with percussion. Sure. Um, yeah. Go for so it. So the, the full title is The Downfall of Paris, and it started as a protest song in France, actually. And the earliest records are from the 1780s, when French revolutionaries were protesting the aristocracy. They had lyrics to it. And I think it was uh, the lyrics were not very favorable towards the aristocracy. Okay. Um, I don't really know what they were, uh, but that's kind of where it started. And it's the exact same time of the American Revolution. Eventually, the song came over to America, and Ben Franklin, of course, had ties to France. Yes. But he knew the song. And they, I think they manipulated some of the lyrics and put it into English, and the new title was It Will Succeed, and the it was the revolution. Oh. So... 
yeah, so Franklin made it a rallying song, started in Philadelphia, and then from there, eventually they dropped the lyrics, and the fifers and drummers and the regiments uh, started playing the tune, because most people would have known the lyrics, and you have a fifer and drummer, you can, as you're marching along, you could sing it, and each division in the army, by law, had to have one drummer. Each 100 soldiers in the Continental Army had to have one drummer. I had no so, idea. Yeah, yeah, so for signaling on the battlefield, so there were drummers... Uh, really, really uh, inside the military, and everyone was well acquainted with this, and the fifers playing the melody really made it uh, kind of exciting, I guess, on long marches. And that's how I figured it out, not from long marches, but like I said about the uh, rudimental training, in one of my early drum books that was actually written, I think, in the 1940s, it's a book called Haskell Har's Snare Drum Method, book two. Okay. This piece is actually in the book. And as a drummer coming up, most of us have had to learn to play this book. Oh. Yeah, it is a tenant of rudimental drumming. If you talk to any rudimental drummer, uh, by and large, they've played this piece, another piece called The Three Camps. There's like about four or five pieces that all of us have played. Okay. And, you know, it's just a rudimental drumming piece. But the reason I fell in love with it is because of the rhythm. Okay. I'm really uh, a jazz person. I'm not really a rudimental drummer, per se. I play drum set a lot more than I play rudimental snare drumming. But what really turned me on to this song, even back in high school, is there's this one rudiment in the piece called a flamacue. And most martial drumming of that era focused on the downbeat. So you'd have like, very strong pulse on the downbeats. The flamacue, by its nature, has the um, accent on the upbeat. So it goes like three, four, so it's extremely yeah. funky compared to all the other rudiments. <laughs> and when you, when you mix it together with all the downbeats, uh, it creates a really nice texture. So I'll just, uh, pardon my singing, but if you had like, all of a sudden it propels you to move your body, and I think that's what made me fall in love with the uh, snare drumming uh-huh. part of it. I can see why. Um, yeah, this is this is very yeah. appealing. Yeah. So, uh, you know, since I've been a teenager, I've loved this piece. Well, as fate would have it, I started playing with a brass ensemble up here in Philly. It's a brass group called the Hickory Brass, full of college professors and professional players. Uh-huh. And my friend Bob is the leader, and he was doing a couple things that required percussion, uh, like some of the soundtrack to Rocky uh, and different patriotic things. So I became a regular member of the group. And Bob was very inviting and said, hey, if anyone wants to do an arrangement for the group, bring it on, we'll try it out. And if, you know, if we like it, we'll try it in front of a crowd of people and see what they think. So, yeah, so I was like, oh, what could I do? And what could be logistically easy to pull off at a concert so I'm not moving and setting things up? Right. And I thought, okay, I just need one instrument. What if I just had a solo snare drum? What could I do? And I went right back to this tune uh, from high school. I found the fife part, which is in D major, uh, the downfall of Paris, Uh and I started arranging it. I'm like, this doesn't look too friendly for brass players to sight read. So I transposed it into B flat. I didn't know how much time we were going to practice it. A friendly key for brass players, yes. (laughs) Exactly. I knew they'd have no trouble reading in B flat. So I added some harmony, some counter rhythms, and we tried it at a concert. I took my snare drum up front. I kind of led the group, and the crowd really liked it, and it became a standard for our group. And that's kind of how it came full circle uh, for me arranging this for Brass Ensemble. You had the group there ready to play, but but now here we are in pandemic times, and, and you've got no group to play with. So Correct. I guess you just rounded up some, some musical friends and individually recorded all of these parts? Collectively, the group that uh, we're going to listen to on this recording, we are called the Rolling Buzzards Brigade. Uh, kind of a silly title, but I put together Drummers Roll, Brass Players Buzz, and brigade for the military, and I thought it kind of worked. So we're the Rolling Buzzards Brigade. And <laughs> this particular recording of my arrangement of the Downfall of Paris really started with someone that I'm pretty sure your listeners are very well acquainted with, uh, the principal trumpet of the Huntsville Symphony Orchestra, Chris Coletti. Right. Everybody here knows mm-hmm. him. They see him in the symphony. Uh, a lot of us have heard him in the Canadian brass, and he's even mm-hmm. been here at the station a couple of times for interviews. So, yeah, he's a real well-known figure here in town such a great guy and a great musician and truth be told i don't think this would have happened without him signing on first i've known chris for about five years we were in some orchestras that did that were freelance orchestras up here in the new york area and that's how i first met him and we've stayed in touch through email and stuff and this past fall 
uh, Chris and I collaborated, and we did a series of educational workshops out of Philly for over a thousand middle school students. And uh, we played a whole variety of different things. He did some solos, we did some jazz, we did different classical. Uh, it was really an interesting collaboration. That's actually on YouTube. It's called Chris Coletti's Cafeteria Concert. And the most widely viewed one on YouTube right now is the Concerto for Trumpet for Harry James. It was our version of that, which oh. is a play on Flight of the Bumblebee. Okay. And we had so much fun doing that, and success with the YouTube views, I don't even know. I think we have almost 5,000 views on that video so far. We decided, like, all right, we enjoyed it, and the audience liked it. What else can we do? So Chris and I started coming up with ideas on how to do more crossover stuff and combining musicians that would not necessarily work together on a uh, daily basis. And we had some ideas for a Monteverdi tune, a Bach, maybe Sousa. I got my friend from the Philadelphia Orchestra, Nitsan Hiros, who is the principal trombonist of the Philly Orchestra. He said he wanted to do it. Everything was kind of up in the air. There was no definite plan, but we knew we wanted to work together uh-huh. and do some old school stuff and give it new life. Unfortunately, because of the shutdown and the pandemic, we had loosely scheduled a meeting to go up to Ithaca and try some um, preliminary recordings and arrangements. Yes. That, of course, was canceled. Yes. So when the pandemic hit, oddly enough, I started getting requests to play in virtual ensembles that I'm sure everyone has seen on YouTube. Mm-hmm. And even though they're not live gigs, it was still a lot of fun to collaborate in a new way. And this all of a sudden woke up my idea for this collaboration with Chris again. And I said, hey, the original plan is on the shelf for now. However, I have this arrangement of Downfall of Paris. It's an old tune. He didn't know it. He was very interested in the story. And just with one email, he said, sure, I'll do it. And how about I play trumpet one and two on the video? Easy easy enough to do when you're recording yourself individually. Let's take a moment here and listen to this piece. And then we'll come back and talk a little about how it gets put together into this format that we've all seen. So here we go with the downfall of Paris, arranged here by Sean Kennedy, who's playing the percussion part and a lot of his other friends we'll talk about them in a few minutes but we'll listen to that now here we go with downfall of paris So that was The Downfall of Paris, arranged by my guest that I'm talking to today, Sean Kennedy, percussionist, who put this together during his downtime during the pandemic. And Sean, we were going to talk a little about what it took to get all of this put together into this format that a lot of us are used to listening to and watching on our computers while we can't go to concerts and musicians can't play together. So you want to tell us a little of what's involved with this? 
Sure. It's a uh, multi-level process. I'll try to make it as quick as possible. I guess the first thing um, that you need to do is have the personnel. Yeah. So yeah. we've already talked about Chris um, and Nitsan, the um, trombonist friend of mine here from the Philadelphia Orchestra. Once those two guys signed on uh, and I started putting requests out, it was pretty easy because I think uh, everybody so wants well-known. to. Everybody yeah. wants to play with them. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So I'll just go through the uh, the list of the ensemble real quick, and then I'll tell you some other stuff. So okay. Chris Coletti played trumpet one and two. A great LA freelancer um, named Tony Lin played the horn part. Nitsan Heros from the Philadelphia Orchestra played trombone. David Earl played tuba, and he is a professor at Ithaca and was recommended by Chris. Okay. And now for the percussion section, I was a snare drummer along with Bernie Dressel, who, if you've seen any movie, you've heard his drumming. He is a legendary Hollywood studio player, played on tons and tons of soundtracks, and has toured with legendary groups. Next is Clayton Cameron, another snare drummer. He toured with Sammy Davis Jr. for 10 years and is an absolute hero of mine. Uh And uh, your viewers might be familiar with him from a video he did in the 90s with Tony Bennett called Tony Bennett Unplugged. Oh. on MTV. So that's Clayton. Okay. Uh, the last snare drummer is David Liu, and he is currently the associate principal timpanist of the Shanghai Philharmonic, but many years ago, he was a student of mine when he was in high school. So that was oh the connection gosh. there. And then there's two more folks involved. Uh, Dave Nelson, a friend of mine here from Philly, he is the principal timpanist from the Philly Pops Orchestra, okay. and he's covering bass drum and cymbals. And then we have another friend from New York, Chihiro Shibayama, is playing cymbals, and she's a fabulous uh, New York freelancer. So that's the ensemble, but how did we get together? I think that was your actual question, is how yeah, does it actually yeah. happen? So before the project started, I was lucky that I used this uh, software program called Finale. A lot of musicians use that right. these days. It's mm-hmm. a computer-based program where it spits out your music and prints it and so forth. Right. So what I did is I had Finale make a um, synthetic version of this, basically. It can play it for you, and you can listen to it. So I had that recorded, and I had a metronome with it as well. And then I overdubbed my live snare drumming on it. So we have the click keeping us together. Okay. Um, the synthetic brass, and me. Do you start it off by just uh, giving everybody a one, two, ready, play? or No, the... no. Um, actually, uh, what I do is you give them a, a blank measure, just like tick, 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 so forth. Uh-huh. And then I do a vocalization, and I say one, two, ready, begin, as if I were in front of them, okay. to make it as easy for them with headphones uh, to play it. So it's like I'm conducting, but uh, through sound. Okay. So I give them as yeah as much lead in. So we had the clicks, my voice saying one, two, ready, go, and then they could play along. And throughout the course of the track that they recorded with, my voice was on there. I was saying um, whatever, repeat. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, I was yelling out markers in the piece uh, in case they had to rest or were unsure. Uh, just to make it, again, as easy as possible so they don't just hear a metronome, which doesn't help you too much without um, signs along the way. Right, right. So I did that, and I sent it to the drummers, and the drummers started uh, adding their portions. Uh, But again, they only heard me and the synthetic brass, and it was really cool because they were all calling me asking questions like, hey, in this measure, I don't see an accent, but it sounds like you stressed that. Should I do that? So that was cool. Yeah. And then the brass was the next layer. Uh, the br- brass was a little more difficult because of intonation. What I did is I had Chris record trumpets one and two first, mm-hmm. and then we blended his trumpet with the previous recordings. Then we had the French horn player play. Then we blended her thing with the click, and I sent them out systematically. So the last person in line was the tuba player. So mm-hmm. when he got it, he had the synthetic brass, the metronome, me, two Chris Colettis, the French <laughs> horn player, and, and the, the trombone. trombone. So they all could get the nuance uh, that Chris had set forth in his first recordings. Right, and, uh, and here kind of the basic intonation. I know maybe people that don't play instruments think, well, you just play a note and it's in tune if you play the note, but that's not really the case, I guess. And it, it has often to do with whether you're part of the harmony or the melody or what part of the chord mm-hmm. you might be playing. So you do need to hear that in order to be in tune with everybody else. Exactly, and that, that's, of course, what the challenge for the brass was. And because I had such world-class players, and as I was getting these individual tracks back, they sounded ridiculously good, I realized how much I don't know about recording yet, that I sent them off to a professional recording engineer friend of mine who actually made three different versions of this. We have the full ensemble with brass and percussion, we have a percussion-only version, and we have a brass-only version, and 
it sounds like we're in a church together playing or some big area because of the reverb he put in and it's incredible so it was an amazing process and now a, vi- a video engineer friend of mine in chicago is working on making a youtube version of this available oh okay okay well one one final question about all of that though because for those of us that really don't do anything like that are you able to go back later and take off the tracks of your voice and the metronome do you just suck those back out yeah what what happens is uh if i asked you to play i would send you the audio and you would set up a mic, and you would have to play it with headphones on. Uh-huh. So you're listening to the track, and you're recording into your microphone. But when you send me your audio version, I don't hear the stuff I sent you because you had headphones on. Oh, okay. Now I understand. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Right. And then, yes, that original track I did was, um, that was Gospel Truth. Like, everything had to go with that, and the engineer had it, and then he can line it up. And the video guy, just to go to one step further, the video is the opposite. When you do the video, you shoot the video with the audio that you've already produced loud so that the (laughs) video engineer can hear it. And okay. then he mutes everything at the end. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it struck me, um, Chris Coletti had sent me something last week to play on the air. A small group of Huntsville Symphony musicians playing Charles Ives' Unanswered Question. And it came yep. off very well, and we watched it there. We could see the musicians playing in their little boxes. And he just mentioned after the fact, he said, yeah, you know, this took me probably between 40 and 60 hours to put together. And I thought, oh, my gosh, but I can see how they're so many steps involved in this process and um oh yeah won't it be great when we get back to the day where you can just stroll into the concert (laughs) hall and sit down and play the things that you practiced and hear everybody playing in real time around you and have a conductor to guide you and have an audience applaud at the end i can't wait for that day Oh, me too. I know. We we, we appreciated it when we had it, but um, I think this really emphasizes what a special um, opportunity that is for all of us to engage in those performances and to watch live performances. Sean, we are musically celebrating our nation's founding all week, and I really appreciate your taking time to fill us in on a little of our country's musical heritage with the downfall of Paris and to give us a glimpse of musicians' lives during this challenging time that we're living in. So I want to say good luck to you and all of your musician friends, and hope you guys can stay safe. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity, and uh, have a great Fourth of July.